Hey everyone, in episode number three with Greg Dickerson this morning, I think we're going to talk about just three phrases I've heard about or three topics. We're just going to put it all into one video. How are you doing, Greg? I'm doing great, Michael. How about you? I'm doing wonderful. So there's one phrase that I think I heard for the first time, like it might be two decades ago, uh, but I'm hearing it a lot more today uh, in the real estate world specifically. And that is the notion of cash is trash. Mm -hmm. When you hear that, you know, I, I guess first question is, when's the first time you heard that just probably a while ago? And then when you hear that today, what what what, what do you think about? Yeah, I don't know about the first time. I've, you know, I've kind of always heard it, you know, along the yeah, way, but you know, hey, don't throw it away, burn it. It can keep <laughs> the house, okay? So, you know, cash is not trash. It, you can use it for other things. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it always has value, right? There's always marginal value. <laughs> if you don't, don't throw it away, burn it, use it to clean yourself, whatever you need to do. Cash is, you know, it's not cash trash. isn't trash. No, That's I'm just kidding. I don't know when the first time I heard it is, but I do know that there's a number of different uh, meanings when somebody says cash is trash. Yeah. So let's talk about when you hear, because again, a lot of people you and I are helping, right? Um, a lot of the kind of noise and the push in the world now is don't, because there's so many, there's, tr there, somebody said there's a trillion dollars in money markets and bank accounts, you know, now, like never before. And there's a lot of people talking about that's, that's dry powder on the sidelines. And there are, I think there's almost a momentum trying to make people feel bad for having excess cash in the banks because of, of where we are in the environment. Um, mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, go deploy it, go deploy it, get it out of your hands. Don't let it burn a hole in your pocket. You're earning nothing in the bank. And um, I don't feel that way, but maybe I'm wrong, right? I, I think cash, I think cash is an option on the future. Mm -hmm. And I don't look, a lot of people are talking about, hey, keeping cash in the bank for 10 or 20 or 30 years is, is a bad idea. Sure. But that's, that's not what I'm doing. Uh, and I don't, I don't like the, I don't like the momentum of making feel, making people feel bad and, and saying, Hey, your cash is, is trash. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, so cash is trash. A lot of people, you know, will look at that and think, okay, number one, the first understanding is, you know, devaluation. Okay. So is, is money losing value? Number two, is it worth more somewhere else versus just sitting in a bank? So let's say it's not losing value. It's worth some, you know, worth more than where it's just kind of sitting in an account, money market, whatever. And then number three is the velocity of, mm. okay. So first and foremost, let's take cash off the table. Okay. okay. Forget the paper, forget the paper of cash. Again, you know, at one day save your cash because one day you might need to burn it to heat the house because it's going to go digital. At some point it may, there may be no more currency. It might all be digital. Mm. So what we're talking about is the dollar, not necessarily the paper of cash. So cash in and of itself may very well be trash one day, you know, but the dollar is what we're really talking about. And the value of the dollar, the confidence in the dollar and what it's backed up by and with. That is where, you know, I fundamentally disagree with people that say, you know, the dollar is going to lose its value. We're not going to be the reserve currency of the world. You know, all these, all these other types of things. You know, um, I don't buy that. I don't believe that. I believe that the dollar in U.S. currency in whatever form it takes will always reign supreme, you know, because we are a country of, that's ruled by law, you know, whereas some of these other countries, they can come in and seize that stuff. You know, all bets are off. You just don't know. Look at what's happening with, you know, Alibaba and Jack Ma in China, you know, and, and those types of things. I mean, you, you know, you get outside the United States where any, all, all bets are off and anything goes, you just, you just don't know. So we are the safe haven of the world. We have the biggest GDP. Um, I think we will probably always have the biggest GDP. I don't know that we will get surpassed. We might, you know, in terms of manufacturing and things like that. But the problem is, is that it's not, um, those are not free economies where that happens. It's very controlled. And, you know, where in the United States, it's still a free republic, regardless of who's in, who's in office and, and what's going on. It's going to remain that way. That's not going to change, um, you know, at least anytime soon that I can foresee. So, in terms of the statement and the philosophy of, you know, the dollar being used to its highest and best use. So that's really the conversation. Is your money better deployed somewhere else? Do you have to deploy it uh, versus leaving it, leaving it sitting somewhere? Whenever somebody says that, understand who they are and what they're selling, because that comment comes from somebody who's selling an investment somewhere else. So when somebody tells you cash is trash, you need to move it. It's generally because they have something for sale that they're trying to get you to deploy your cash into. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I, I guess, have you ever had the mindset 
and you know it's i some people are almost like they 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 have to repel the cash right like cash is you know like if they keep it in the bank they're going to go spend it on something stupid um, mm-hmm. have, have you ever felt like you know have you i guess this is a question for you have you ever felt like you had too much cash uh no i mean you know so you got to be disciplined but yeah i mean it's like the, it's like the old thing when you're growing up as a kid you know if you get a 20 dollar bill and you break it it's gone right so yeah. So yeah, people can, you know, get into the comfort zone of having a lot of cash and wanting to spend it on, you know, things that don't matter and, you know, things that are going to, to lose their value. And that's where, you know, the devaluation and the cash is trash. And that's the other mindset of cash is trash. I think like Grant Cardone, when he says cash is trash, what he means is his own personality is that he's going to want to spend it. He's going to blow it if it, if he doesn't deploy it. So he doesn't want to keep money. Mm-hmm. He wants to get it out working. And I, I had that mindset for a while. I remember... I had so much cash flow in general from all my companies and everything. I was like, man, I gotta, I've got to corral this and grow it while I'm waiting to deploy it. You know, so, you know, sweep accounts, this, that, and the other, you know, just in the general transaction, you know, uh, volume of what was going on, you got a third, I have $30 million going through my bank account every year, you know, with wow. different companies, you know, so you want to maximize that um, burn, you know, and that churn of, of the cash coming and going. So, uh, you know, I don't feel like there's ever a standpoint, or, you know, I guess at that point, I probably have too much cash, but <laughs> I've never felt like too much, you yeah. know, cash. And I've never felt like enough is enough either, because uh, you just never know what can happen. And I've seen some very, very, very wealthy, liquid people lose their liquidity, yeah, you know, me too. by deploying and putting it into things and having that sense of urgency and so man, I got, I have to grow this. And I remember early on, you know, I had that mindset and I got to grow this. I can't let it just sit there. And, you know, one of my mentors told me, said, look, you should have at least 50% of your net worth liquid at all times. Cause you just never know. You can't spend equity. Yeah. You know, you cannot spend equity and you can't always tap equity, you know, cash is King and it always has been. And anybody who says cash is trash, look through any economic downturn. Who makes the rules? Yeah. Who gets the deals? The people that have the cash. Yep. There you go. That's awesome. I think that that's what we will close on that topic. The neither one I heard today, or yes, when did uh, this is a Grant Cardone video? He put it out, and in the video, I think he's talking about his 2021 opportunities. It's about a half hour Mm -hmm. video. It is what it is, but he starts talking about. I think it's in the title. Says debt is an asset. So first off, as an accountant, that freaks me out because debt, <laughs> debt sits in the liability <laughs> column. It's not an asset. So that that just kind of mentally punches me in the face. Um, but I, you know, as I kind of sat back and I, and I thought about what he was trying to say there, I mean, I get it, right? If the debt costs you 2%, but you can earn 10, just for example, mm-hmm. I kind of get it. But I think it sends the wrong message to most folks because most Americans don't handle debt well already, right? So there at least has to be a, a qualifier on which debt is an asset. But if somebody were to come up to you just out of the blue and tell you debt's an asset, what would you think? Well, I know what I know. So I'm like, you know, the right kind of debt, absolutely. You know, so there's good debt, there's bad debt, there's consumer debt, there's investment debt you know, those types of things, there's full recourse and non-recourse debt. So there's all kinds of debt with all kinds of little windows and closets and doors to go through. So I'm sure, or I would assume he qualified that comment and, and, and explained what good debt, bad debt was just like assets versus liabilities. So now when I started my career, I took a lot of bad debt to get going credit cards. I financed vehicles, you know, high interest rates. I used credit cards, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's where it can get dangerous. And I heard something this morning I was listening to where, you know, somebody was talking about, you know, getting zero interest credit cards because you can sign up and get those, tap them for their cash advance, invest them in, you know, Bitcoin or something like that, and then pay them off, you know, before they, you know, start accruing interest using debt to oh. lever into investments or get that spread. And, you know, a lot of people have that mindset. and We all did it where you tap equity in properties or in your house to go reinvest, you think, well, with interest rates where they're at now, it's almost like free money. You know, if you've got a two to 3%, you know, HELOC or whatever or equity line on your properties, you should be able to redeploy that and, and get a nice little spread on it. So that makes sense. So that is an asset, right? That's, that's an asset that you can lever into good debt. Yeah. But- I, I just want to go back to your example, because this is what, this is, this is why that phrase bothers me. It's not the 
five or 10% of us that understand what you understand. It's the 90% that hear that phrase, go get an interest, go get a 0% interest credit card, call it 10 grand. Say they get 10 of them. They now have a hundred grand. Then they go buy Bitcoin at $40,000 or $41,000, which it was on Saturday. And now it's Monday at $32,000. What are you going to do with that folks? You are down 20%, right? You now, so that's you, you, congratulations. You have an asset, call it Bitcoin. That's now worth 80 grand. You were short 20 grand. And oh, by the way, that interest rate period ends in six months or whatever it is. You're going to have two credit cards charging you 18% and you owe that 20 grand in that example. Yeah, you know, it's really, you know, Bitcoin, you know, where they go open a Robinhood account and start, you know, buying stocks at the all time record highs. You or know. options so again, or whatever, jeez. So whatever, yeah, lever it up. So, you know, again, remember, it's better to know the top than the bottom, you know. And if you look at Bitcoin in terms of what it is, it's interesting to me, okay? It's an algorithm, yep. okay? I mean, it's created by somebody nobody knows, okay? I think there's like this wizard back there that's pulling all these <laughs> strings that all the money is going back to. So whoever that, you know, uh, Nakamoto or whatever his name is, Satoshi, or I can't remember, yeah. that that wrote the paper that, that supposedly created this. So if you created this unbreakable, unhackable, so difficult to mine algorithm, well, you certainly know how to harvest it. If you created it, you'd know how to get in there and harvest it. So I think what he's done and whoever that, or could be a group of people is they've set the table for all of these institutions that are now jumping in at these prices. They're going to suck all that money out. This thing's going to tank. <laughs> it's going to go back down to, you know, whatever, 2000, 4,000 bucks, and then boom, it'll be off to the races again. Then they'll do it all over again. So there, there is a, it could be a country. It could be an organization. It could be an individual that is behind all this, but look, it's a, it's a digital algorithm. Yeah. There's no, there's nothing backing it. It's not insured. It crashes, it gets hacked. You can't always cash it in. So just for people that are listening, when you go buy Bitcoin, you can't always get your money back and turn it into cash immediately. I mean, I've seen it locked up for days where people couldn't get their money. They couldn't sell it. You can certainly trade it, but it's only worth what somebody else is willing to give, you know, value exchange. So at some point it's going to become a transfer between very wealthy individuals, institutions, you know, things like that. And then, and then the other thing is, we know it's being used to launder money. We know it's being used for drug money transfers. We know it's being used for a lot of really bad things. So at the end of the day, you got to ask yourself, do you really want to profit there in that, yeah. in that world? So there's a lot of things about Bitcoin that a lot of people just don't understand. It's purely speculative. It's truly speculative. You know, uh, it, it, it's, it's facing a lot of regulatory scrutiny right now. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens and where it goes. Yeah, I mean, I I think we've had this conversation once. I actually moved, or I was in the process of moving 1% of my net worth into it as an insurance hedge. Mm-hmm. T- 10 or 15 years ago, I used gold and silver. It, it was a much smaller number, obviously, right? I was worth a lot less 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, I wanted to have that just-in-case hedge, uh, like kind of an insurance policy, non-correlated. So I was in the process, and um, I have a coin now, a little bit more, and I got it. I don't know, seemingly like 16 weeks or yeah, six, six or eight weeks ago. And to see it double in that time frame was not a good feeling. Cause I, mm-hmm. I remember 17 when, a, when like one of my top two or three friends came over and was dancing on my couch talking about Bitcoin. I'm like, what the hell is this thing? This is like smoke. What are you doing? Right. So fear of missing out. The consumer was last time, but I started to feel better. Right. You had Jamie Dimon come out put a price target of 147. You had Druckenmiller, all these other folks coming out talking about um, family offices and hedge funds and the ETF coming. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I am in the process of moving 1% there. I'm not a bull. I'm going to keep it in what they call cold, cold storage. We either go to zero or some other number, mm-hmm. but I don't look at it. I mean, there are people that I've actually done like two videos on three videos on Bitcoin in the title. It's amazing what kind of attraction that that brings you oh yeah this fear of missing out is crazy and i've seen just in the last 48 hours i think i saw 12 or 13 posts in my facebook feeds about individuals buying a a, what is it called a fractional coin i'm like oh now we're back to the consumer now we're back to the individuals fear of missing out and lo and behold 
it's down 10 grand or 25% in 48 hours. It's, it's just amazing. Yeah, I mean, you could go to zero, just like stocks, you know, a, comp- a stock can be wiped out. We've seen companies oh, yeah. wiped out. So just, just because, you know, the, I, I think the stock market's the same kind of thing. It's, it's, you know, it's, it it's ridiculous what happens and what's allowed. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day with Bitcoin, the thing you got to remember is they say it's so valuable because only so much of it can be created. Yeah. 21. It's million. just a digital currency. It's just a, not even a currency. It's a digital value exchange. Mm-hmm. And, if somebody can start it and create it, well, they can create more. So that they're, you know, and, and if it gets to a point where it doesn't make any sense, well, then there can be another cryptocurrency. And, you know, PayPal's gonna have their own, Facebook's gonna have their own, Amazon's gonna have their own. I mean, everybody's gonna have their own little digital currency. So Bitcoin is not always gonna be the be all end all. Right. And again, if somebody created it to begin with, they can control it and they can create more. Yeah. There you go. Well, let's let's close it on that. Again, I wanted to talk about Bitcoin. I think we kind of worked it in there. Uh, Greg, thank you very much for your time here this week. It's always a lot of fun. Yeah, man. It was enjoyed it. Thank you.